Hello, today is April 19th, 2021. My name is Leslie Torres. I'm interviewing Misael Ramirez for the University Library Special Collections and Archives at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, <clears throat> hereafter abbreviated as UTRGV. <clears throat> This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Ms. Ramirez, that this interview will be placed in the University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV and shared with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. University Library Special Collections and Archives will archive your interview, along with any other photographs or other documentation you are willing to share. UTRGV University Library will retain copyright or non-exclusive right to the interview and any other materials you donate to the Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV. <clears throat> because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting to make sure you agree with our interview procedures before we continue. So. I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each question. One, do you give University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your materials at the UTRGV University Library? Yes. Do you grant UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest and copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives to post this video on the internet, post this interview on the internet, where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes. Do you grant the, the University Library Special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voces of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include posting the interview on the internet? Yes. As you recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form. We use information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure VOSA server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before VOSA sends it to UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your, your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRGV University Library. The final two questions ask for your consent on what I just described. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives? Yes. On occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and VOSAs receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I do. Thank you for your consent. Your experiences and stories mean a lot to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives. I look forward to what you say in the interview questions I will now ask. So, Misael, like I said, thank you for your time. Um, your stories and experiences are valuable to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and the VOSIS Project. Particularly for us at UTRGV Special Collections, we are committed to preserving the stories of Mexican Americans and Latinos from South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley, and those who work closely with these populations during the COVID-19 pandemic. Because you are heavily in involved in Rio Grande Valley community outreach, and you are, cre you are the creator of local organization Craft Cultura, and because you are a son, brother, and a friend who is knowledgeable of the ways COVID-19 has affected others in his inner circle, I know you have many meaningful stories and experiences to share on how COVID-19 has impacted these roles you carry out in your life. So before I ask you to share stories about your life in this pandemic, tell us, who is Misael Ramirez? Oh, just thank you for having me, Leslie. Um, well, my name is Misael Ramirez. I'm a 28 year old South Texas native, I'm originally born and raised in Corpus Christi, Texas. I'm the kid of immigrants. Parents came from Zacatecas and Saltillo. Uh, migrated to Corpus Christi with my older brother. And that's where I was born in Corpus Christi. So um, I'm the creator of Craft Cultura, a Chicanx community-based organization based in social justice and liberation. Um, and yeah, um, UTRGV alum. I majored in Mexican American studies. And uh, a lot of the work that I do, as you mentioned, is community outreach, community-based. 
trying to educate um, the, our community really in a culturally relevant way, in ways that are accessible to them. Um, so that's a little bit about me and, uh, you know, ask away. Okay, so the first question I wanna ask you is, when did you first hear about COVID-19? How did you learn about it? Through radio, TV, social media, et cetera? Yeah, I think a, a mix of all of those, like not radio, but definitely through like social media, TV, uh, maybe December, what is it? Yeah, December when it first started like really becoming relevant in the news. Um, that's when I first heard about it, but through through the news mostly, through social media as well. And what was your first reaction to the information about COVID-19? I think shock, just it was something new. So you don't know how serious it is. I just didn't know how, I definitely didn't know how serious it was going to be, how it was going to impact the entire world. Um, I thought it was something that was just kind of overseas that wouldn't reach us. I've never lived through a pandemic, so you just, uh, you don't know what that's like until you're actually in one. And, um, but my initial reaction was just kind of like watching from afar um, and, and knowing that it was serious, but also like, like I said, it was just so foreign that it hadn't impacted anybody that, that I know yet. It was, it was like, you know, something that was going on overseas. And over the last, oh. oh, okay. So at what point did you realize this pandemic was a serious life altering event or do you not think it's serious and why? Definitely serious. And, but I'd say like in January, February of 2020 is when it started to become a little bit more serious, especially like in February. Um, it wasn't until March, I was watching a basketball game, NBA, with my buddy, my roommate at the time, and we were just going to hang out, watch the games, and I remember they canceled the game, like, at halftime, and I've never seen any pro sports teams cancel a game mid-game mid on national television, and it was due to COVID, so that, that made it very real. Um, and they canceled the game that uh, was after, which was like in another city. So the game we were watching was like in Dallas. So that was Texas now. So I remember seeing uh, people enter the stadium and get sanitized because the owner, Mark Cuban, was taking it pretty seriously at the time. One of the first like NBA owners that was taking it seriously. And then the, the following game was gonna be in Los Angeles. So now you're, you're, you're talking about Texas and California. Um, but when it got canceled in Dallas at the Dallas Mavericks game, I was like, okay, this might be serious. Wow, they just canceled a game. And then they canceled the uh, Los Angeles Clippers game. Um, and that's really for me when it was serious. Like I said, because sports, rarely do they just stop playing. That's a lot of money on the line. That's millions. Um, so that's when I knew something was up when it was breaking news and then the the rest of the season was canceled. Uh, and then other sports teams followed, uh, sports leagues across the world. And really when, it, when sports leagues started shutting down, that's when I really was like, okay, this is serious. Okay. And over the last year, what news media, social media, and or other sources do you rely on to keep you informed about coronavirus? Uh, I usually watch like, at the time at least, the news on, on YouTube, so it could be MSNBC, it could be CNN, it could be Democracy Now. It could also be live footage or narratives from citizens from across the world that are, you know, doing their own journalism of what's going on. I feel like it really helps, especially so much use of social media now. But. Right. Yeah, social media was definitely one of those um, outlets, news outlets. And can you share with me what you understand about COVID-19 as an infectious disease and any of its variants? Likewise, can you share with me what you don't understand about this new coronavirus? 
Yeah, I mean that it's a deadly disease that, uh, you know, it attacks your your lungs, it attacks your respiratory system, and that it was very easy to, you know, get other folks sick from it just by from contact, from, you know, coffee and all. It, it just had to do with a lot of us being very vigilant about who we made contact with. Um, but yeah, definitely that's a deadly disease that plagued the entire world. And again, it wasn't, I think a fast forward a year into it. Uh, we have more knowledge about it, but I still don't understand. Um, I know what I can do to keep others safe, but there's still a lot that I don't understand about the disease and its variants. Um, and I think most people don't understand a lot of it if we're still looking for a cure. We got the vaccine now, but we're, you know, we're not 100% cleared yet. So I think there's still a lot to understand about what COVID-19 is, what it isn't. Um, but things are looking brighter now, so that's good. Okay, and on that note, can you tell me what you know about the various vaccines available to the public and how do you feel about these vaccines? Um, it's good that we finally have vaccines now. Uh, I personally got the Moderna vaccine about two weeks ago in Harlingen. And um, yeah, just it, it felt, I kept seeing everybody post their little vaccine cards. And yeah, it just kind of felt like you went to go vote. You did your part in this global pandemic, this historic moment. Um, and it's really to keep yourself safe, others safe, family members safe community um, but I, I won't act like I know all about Moderna what they just injected in me I, I was just like you know what like let's if it's FDA approved then okay you know I I, I don't want to say I fully trust it but hey like it's better than not getting it okay and I know you just mentioned that you got the Moderna so would you like to share your vaccination story with me now or perhaps later in this interview uh, sure. I mean, it's pretty basic. I think you just, I just had to stay up uh, late to find a place to register that would vaccinate me. And uh, at around midnight, I was just kind of scrolling, refreshing the page through CVS's website. And that's where there was a location in Harlingen. I live in Edinburgh, so Harlingen's about 45 minutes away. And yeah, so I... I after work, I drove to Harlingen and uh, I got my vaccine at a CVS. So, you know, you grow up going to these little pharmacies, Walgreens, CVS. I never did you think that this, these are going to be the locations where you get vaccinated oh, during a pandemic. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fairly simple. Um, I think, again, due to social media technology, there's apps now. And it was just an easy process, very millennial friendly. And uh, yeah, I was, I was happy at, at the treatment, how quick it went by. I was more nervous um, before I got vaccinated. Like, I was going to have side effects. Um, but no, everything went well. Just a little sore arm, but nothing too bad. Was there a lot of people? No, I mean, everybody's scheduled. So I think, okay. uh, you, yeah, everybody's on a schedule there. You have an appointment. So um, those people shopping at CVS, but... Besides that, nothing, nothing too crazy. There weren't lines or anything. Okay. Mm. Do your family members hold the same belief, beliefs as you about COVID-19 or are there some that who take it more seriously or lightly? Yeah, my family members take it seriously. They've all been vaccinated. They're fully vaccinated. I still have one vaccine to go, but my mom, my dad, my brother, they're fully vaccinated now. Um, Corpus did a really good job of rolling out those vaccines early on this year. Um, as soon as they were available um, so but I also do have family members a little bit more extended family that um, their beliefs about COVID aren't as stern or maybe they don't believe it it's real and uh, that's disheartening because it's you know the science backs it up and I think they just don't want to believe so yeah there's also friends you know, that think it's like a conspiracy, that 
it's not real and and it just depends a lot on like how you inform yourself and it says a lot about you actually about what kind of uh, citizen you are and what kind of person you are um but yeah my immediate family they do definitely take it serious and we've done our part hopefully to just be as safe as possible in the community so for these next set of questions, I'd like to talk about how you've seen COVID-19 affect family members, friends, and yourself. I understand that you visit your family in Corpus Christi. Um, have you seen a difference in how COVID-19 has been treated in Nueces County versus in Hidalgo County? Oh, they, like I said, they just rolled them out quicker over there. So my brother was really trying to tell me like, hey, come, come, um, you know, get vaccinated over here early on. Um, but I just kind of waited until they, they rolled them out over here in, in Hidalgo County. But in Noises County, they definitely did a better job of rolling them out sooner. I, I don't know what that has to do with, but um, they definitely made sure folks could get vaccinated at schools and parking lots and stadiums. And, you know, so that was good to see. Um, but I'd say in the Valley, folks are more disciplined when it comes to wearing masks. Um, you know, so that's also good to see is that personal responsibility. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And going more specific with your family, can you share with me in general, how many members are in your family and who are they to you? It's four of us total. So it's my, it's me, uh, my mother, uh, my father and my brother. So yeah, we're, we're a pretty uh, small knit family. Uh, like I mentioned, my folks migrated from Mexico in 88 to Corpus Christi. That's where they raised me and my brother. And they're still there to this day. So they, they, they lived their lives there. Uh, they decided to, you know, just raise us there and, and stay there once we went, went off to college. They're still there in Corpus Christi. Okay. And I know you mentioned they're in Corpus Christi and you're in Edinburgh. So have you had to visit your family less than usual due to the pandemic? And if so, what has that been like? Definitely when it first started, like last March, um, that was, you know, and I got sick in March. And I, I don't, to this day, I don't know if it was COVID or not, but, you know, we were, we were about to shut down a week from when I got sick. So I remember getting like, and I rarely get sick, I, getting like the chills, a lot of flu-like symptoms, the symptoms of COVID, um, body aches, migraine type of feelings. I've never had a migraine. Um, I, I wasn't hungry for about three days, just drinking fluids. I'd get full, just drinking like Gatorades, Powerades, um, just get dizzy. And so I was really nervous uh, that I had if I had COVID and um, by about day four, I felt better and I went to a, a clinic and they wouldn't even see me because COVID cases were so high at the time that by the time that I, I uh, my body recovered, you needed to have a temperature of about like a hundred or high. you had to have a fever to be checked. Um, but due to that, once we were on lockdown and quarantine, I definitely went to Corpus a lot less um, as, as I would have usually been. So I stayed locked down for a good two, three months in my, in my apartment. Okay. And what was that like? Um, it was an experience to say the least. It was, um, it allowed me to really, you know, just hone in on my craft. Um, I had a lot of free time, so I could, I used that time personally to read, to figure out ways how to grow my organization, Craft Cultura, how we can impact the community through this pandemic, um, how we can grow. Uh, so yeah, I, I would usually kind of space my days out, like the first half of the day, I kind of I like to say that I put myself through grad school. Like I would just 
really use the first half of the day to read and write, reflect. And then that's, I wouldn't watch too much TV news. Uh, I made sure not to like just have pandemic news on all day. And then that second half of the day, I might go exercise around five, six. And then that second half of the day, I just allowed myself to kind of hang out, uh, watch some Netflix. Uh, but but I, I'd use that time to follow up with the news and see what was going on. Okay. And just see what's going on around the country. Um, but yeah, with that, with all that free time, and I, I was living by myself at the time, um, you have nothing but time to think, what is, what's the meaning of all this? Uh, why did this happen? Why is it, uh, what, what's going on? So it was a lot of time to reflect plan what, what what got us here um, when we get out of this how are we going to step back into this world um, you may never get this chance again uh, with so much free time so how are you going to grow in that time so that time really allowed me to go inward and just uh, work on that self-development because all the distractions that we usually have in our day-to-day -day lives, that fast-paced life, they were all gone. Uh, your favorite restaurants are closed, your favorite bars, your favorite places to hang out with friends, can't visit family. So it's nothing but you know, time to really you know, go inward. So um, I really took advantage of, of that quarantine lockdown time, but it was still nerve wracking. I'm not gonna lie, watching the news and watching the deaths rise and rise and get closer and closer to the valley each week the numbers got higher so that did make it i'm not gonna say it was just like i was just hanging out it was definitely i was very aware of what was going on um, and just trying to uh figure out again like what what's going on okay yeah. When the pandemic was at its peak, did you and your family find solace in remote communication such as Zoom or phone calls? When, when do you think it was at its peak? Like when was it at its peak? Probably from March to August. March to August, okay. Uh, okay, then, then not necessarily Zoom calls, but phone calls, probably every night. Just call each other, just uh, check up on each other but we already do that anyway so we're already a close family so i'm just kind of checking up what you eat today what you do cracking jokes um and making sure like thankfully nobody was sick at that time so it was just kind of like how, how's how are things in corpus how are things in the valley and so, and so forth okay and how did the pandemic impact family traditions, customs, and holiday celebrations? For example, did you celebrate birthdays and Christmas differently? Did you have a traditional Thanksgiving or did you celebrate in a different way during this pandemic? There, my brother has a birthday in July. I think for that one, I did go back to Corpus. And Thanksgiving by then, things were not at its peak anymore, but they were still bad. Um, so I definitely went down for Thanksgiving. And those were just decisions that, uh, you know, some may fault me for um, or not agree with. But to me, uh, we, we, we made sure to uh, go for Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah. And, and especially because my mom had COVID and she got, and she made it out. So, and COVID almost took her out. Um, she was in the hospital for 13 days and you don't know if you're gonna see this person again. So this Thanksgiving was especially special to have her in the kitchen, making our favorite dishes, her favorite dishes and uh, really being thankful, uh, really living the meaning of that holiday. Um, you know, not, not, yeah. So that, that was special uh, because we don't, we don't really celebrate Thanksgiving, the, the pilgrim in India, like that's not what we said. We just celebrate the time together. Um, 
And yeah, this Thanksgiving was very special because we had our mother uh, that had made it. And uh, so, yeah, but as far as like other family traditions, other holidays, uh, you know, we, like I said, we're a small family, so we don't have like 20 people. We don't have like 30 people in our family that comes over for Thanksgiving. It's literally just us four. So all birthdays, holidays, regardless, we're, we're, a, we're a little team. And uh, so it's, we're able to kind of stay safe. Okay. And if you attended any weddings, graduations, or funerals, can you please share with me how the pandemic made these events different from pre-pandemic times? If you I didn't, yeah, I didn't attend any like, funerals or graduations. Okay. Oh, well, well, actually, I'm sorry. My brother got hit. He graduated in January and due to COVID, he couldn't graduate um, at his university, Michigan State. Um, so he was getting his PhD, which is a big moment, you know, and, and so we had, you know, in May 2020, we had planned to fly to Michigan to see him walk the stage. And due to COVID, all those plans went out the window. So he prolonged his graduation to January. And um, yeah, so he defended his dissertation via Zoom from Corpus Christi. Um, in the room that we grew up in and uh, that made it different but special also because usually the traditional graduations are you know at a stadium um, at, a, at a coliseum somewhere you know of significance and but this one was even of more significance because we were together it was different folks from all over the country his friends could uh, tune in to his dissertation see him defend and that made it like really special. And knowing that it's not like just him going through this, it's the entire world is going through this. Um, and, you know, the, the, the important part is the, the journey that got him there, not necessarily just walking the stage. So that was a special moment, a special graduation, um, because like, like I said, we're a small team, so you know, my mom was so excited to be a part of that and, you know, hey, go get some balloons at Party City, you know, my dad, let's go get some ribs, let's barbecue, let's, let's make him feel like he graduated, you know, let's, when he gets out of the door, once he defends his dissertation, like, we threw a little party for him, you know, just a small team. And that was one of the, the most uh, special days of my life, to see something that my brother worked so hard for. Um, but that we were there to celebrate with him um, because it's a it's a team effort but just to see him um, celebrate with us that was awesome that was that was i think more special than walking across the stage and shaking the hand of somebody that you really don't know you know the dean of the universe the president like there's no connection there um, so the first person to like hug you is your mom your dad your brother um, and we're crying together, we're laughing, we got confetti, you know, so, so that, that made it special. That made it really special. It sounds really nice. Yeah. Okay, and so you, you mentioned earlier um, that your mother con contracted the COVID-19 virus late last year. So can you describe the, pro the, sorry, can you describe the thought process that you went through when you found out and how you coped? Yeah, she was just sick for about a week. She wasn't getting any better. So um, you just kind of hope that that little flu goes away, those symptoms at least. And she just got worse and worse and worse. And at a week's end, uh, I was in the Valley. My brother was in Michigan getting the rest of his things from his apartment. Um, and my dad called and said that she was really bad and he sounded worried, panicked, frozen in the moment. Didn't know what to do. So immediately I drove down to the valley. I mean, uh, from the valley to Corpus, drove up. And then I called and she sounded really bad on the phone. So I, I had to call 911 on, on the drive. And um, from there, the ambulance picked her up and they started working on her immediately. And yeah, uh, that was one of the 
that really human like oh COVID hit us now like it hit home it wasn't somebody you know somebody you know another relative it was like this is your mom now like it hit home and uh that made it very scary because again it's not this disease that you know anything about yet and you're constantly watching the news and it's nothing but death there aren't really any uh hopeful stories um so that was just how how do we cope uh, i think we really just had to tap into our faith and uh just hope that creator god gave her more time or work worked on her while she was in there and uh we just cope by staying strong as a, as a unit me my brother my dad family would call friends uh, and they would just give us really kind words of support you know a, a friend of ours that lost his father not to covid but just lost his father just told us he just called me and he was like hey man don't don't forget to eat you know so some, things like that like you don't even remember to eat when you're just in that zone of possibly losing somebody so just simple little reminders of uh take care of yourself she has the best doctors right now taking care of her but you need to take care of yourself you know in, in that like there's nothing you can do to go in that room and that's the ugly thing of this disease is that you can't even hold your loved one hold their hand take them flowers go visit them uh, you know so it was definitely a dark time uh, but she definitely fought hard and, and got better every day the hospital she went to was a small one, so she got really good intimate care. And very first day she was in, she got the plasma treatment, which was something new at the time. Her body responded well. And uh, yeah, every single day was like, just hoping for better news, better news. And, and she still sounded a little bit bad, but now she's talking on the phone again. She has her humor back. Um, doctors are giving good updates. And uh, you kind of learn how to be a caregiver from a distance, literally. Uh, you know, we can call her twice a day. So what are you going to do in, the, in that time? Uh, but yeah, 13 days she was in there. And uh, there was definitely a, a roller coaster of emotions during that time. Uh, but, you know, she, she fought through. She's a warrior and she made it. And when, when did she first get sick? Like that month? Maybe October. Maybe in October, I, I think so. Uh, I think October. Um, yeah, you know, and, and she already has pre-existing conditions. She has diabe uh, diabetes. So it really attacks your other, uh, you know, vulnerable spots and um, and then we had to get tested. We didn't know because we're in the same house. Did we get it? So we all got tested, me, my dad, my brother, and, and none of all of us came out um, negative. So that was strange. Like, how do we not have it, you know? And, um, but yeah, she got it in about October. And that was, that just, you know, it, it brings out real life conversations with, if I lose this person in my life, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna cope? Mm -hmm. you know so how did you cope you know uh i think we're still coping because she has a lot of the effects of covid still to this day almost you know a few months later um so covid has those long lasting effects of being a little bit weaker your immune system is weaker um, you get sick you know more than you used to um so we're it's still a disease that we're figuring out um, but I think you just cope by telling your loved ones you love them, um, being present, you know, just enjoying life every day and knowing that, you know, you don't know when your time's coming, whether it's COVID or not, but uh, just enjoy today, you know, enjoy the day and, and just try to, you know, tell the ones that you love, reach out to them. Don't wait for a pandemic to... Uh, find your purpose or to uh, follow your dreams or to 
say what you got to say. Um, at least for me, that's that's kind of what I've how I've coped is, you know, not leaving things for tomorrow. Um, okay, so going back to you um, during COVID-19, did you feel safe working at your workplace during COVID-19 and why or why not? Well, at the time I worked at a place called Grain to Glass and they actually closed. Uh, I, that, that week that I was sick, I got off of work for a week because I was so sick and I, I didn't want to infect people if I did have it. Um, and once I was ready to go back to work, that's when everything shut down. So uh, they closed down. So uh, as far as like the, the entire country, pretty much. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I felt safe because they didn't stay open. So they closed down. So I was like, all right, they made the right call. Even though they were forced to, I was like, okay, they, they closed down. And they're not forcing us to work like curbside or because there was a lot of businesses that were forced to close down, but also instantly began doing like curbside and exposing their workers to uh, other folks. Um, so thankfully we didn't have to deal with that. Okay. And so, well, like you just mentioned, um, you were laid off, right? Um, due to the pandemic. So how was this stressful for you? And I know you mentioned a little bit earlier, but what did you do with this new time availability? Yeah, so I mean, it, w it wasn't really stressful, like, uh, thankfully, um, I mean, it, it wasn't like a passion job or anything, it was just kind of a job. So, like I said, I was never going to get this amount of time to work on my craft. My organization is called Craft Cultura, and that's really what it's about, working on your craft, whatever it is. So, I was like, wow, I have all this downtime. Uh, I didn't really feel stressed once I knew that we would get um, like unemployment benefits. I was like, okay, I don't really have to take care of anybody else, just myself. Um, this is enough to cover like uh, my expenses in the meantime. Um, and yeah, so I didn't really feel too much of, of that stress, but um, I just felt like I could use this time wisely to work on what I do want to do for a for a living, uh, which is to continue to grow Craft Cultura into a nonprofit and just a community organization to have a cultural center one day to really put these plans into action or at least write them down, start planning uh, long term. So, uh, yeah, with, with, with that downtime, it just really allowed me to hone in. Okay. Um so you mentioned you're on unemployment, but um, so were you wary, wary about obtaining a new job while COVID-19 still existed slash exists? And if so, do you feel safe working in the public sphere now? Yeah, definitely feel safe now. And, and uh, I got a, a, a new job now. Uh, but at that time, I was like, this is, it isn't worth it. If this is covering my expenses, it's not worth risking my life, um, you know? And um, again, like I'm never gonna, I think a lot of people aren't gonna get the, all this opportunity this time to focus on uh, what they're trying to build. So I just kinda, while we were quarantined, just zoned in and uh, yeah, I, I definitely didn't wanna be out and about in the peak of this pandemic that was hitting the valley in really high numbers. Um, you know, the valley was just rising and rising. You gotta think about it, when, when it hit in March, when we shut down, people were still a spring break and people went out to the island in numbers. So a lot of spreaders out here. So I definitely was like weary about going back out, um, jumping the canal. I was like, well, let's ride this wave until it ends. And um, so what have you managed to find joy in during these such tumultuous times during the pandemic era like with fa friendships, family visits, or do you have any new hobbies? That's a good question. Uh, joy. Uh, found joy in a lot of things, but 
definitely family, friends, but I think it's the, the new friendships that I've built during this pandemic, like how I've made friendships through social media, people that I had never physically met, um, and how, you know, people were, people that I've never, people that are in other states that I've become friends with from a distance. And um, yeah, so I, th I think um, I found joy in building my organization, Craft Mokuda, and figuring out ways to build community and engage uh, virtually. And then having people actually attend our virtual events um, and have a good time doing it. Um, new hobbies, I, I think I found new hobbies in life. Jogging, running, taking runs um, through the community, like in neighborhoods, uh, just cooking. Uh, but mostly, yeah, it's, I'd say I really found joy in, in the events that we host for craft. And uh, I feel like through the pandemic, we grew a lot as an org. Uh, and then as far as like joy, also just, just, uh, you know, figuring out ways to keep creating. Um, and, and there's a new energy, a new, um, there's a lot of new inspiration because we're living in a pandemic. So there's new inspiration, new ideas. Um, and it's nice to be a part of that wave of creators in the Valley. So I definitely find joy in that and the fact that I'm a person that creates and hosts events for our community to have joy. Uh, so that that's what brings me joy is hosting events so that others can uh, also share in that joy. Hosting and connecting. Right, right. So this next set of questions focuses on your stories and experiences as the creator of Craft Cultura, um, specifically in the, or as well as in the time of COVID-19. So can, firstly, can you explain to me exactly what um, Craft Cultura is and its main pillars as an organization? Yeah, um, well, Craft Cultura is a community-based Chicanx social justice organization. Uh, we're located in the, in the Rio Grande Valley, the borderlands of South Texas. And our mission is to educate, empower, inspire, and build a better community for our Chicanx community. We're a collective of writers, educators, students, artists, activists, counselors, and overall community members. Um, you know, some of our members, they have PhDs, uh, are in grad school, undergrad, others are high school pushouts. Um, some have backgrounds in activism and social justice work, and others, it's their first time entering this type of work. Um, so we're a collective of South Texas uh, natives and CRAFT is actually an acronym that stands for Creating Real Art for Tomorrow. Um, and our main pillars are community, education, and social justice. Um, so everything that we do, those are the pillars. We're rooted in educating the community. We're rooted in social justice for the community. Uh, and yeah, so we're also rooted in, in just building community and, what, and redefining what that means um, together. So. That's a little bit of, of, of craft of who we are. We're a new organization in the Valley, but going on two years. And um, it's hard to define something that's still being defined. So I don't even, as the creator of craft, I don't even have the full answer to what is craft cultura. And I struggle with that sometimes because we're continuing, we're constantly evolving as the times change when craft was created, we didn't see a pandemic coming. You know, we, we didn't see the world changing, but we evolve as the world evolves. And as I grow personally, the organization grows. And as the organization grows, I grow. So it's, it's, it, it's a struggle sometimes to define what is craft cultura. And I don't know what it's gonna be in five years from now. And I have my goals. But with each person that joins craft, that gets inspired by craft, uh, we're not like a organization that is registered to the city. 
You know, we're a legacy of social justice movements from the 60s. We're a continuation of the work that was started by those before us. We're a continuation of our immigrant parents and our families and our community. We're a continuation of our ancestors um, that resisted assimilating, you know, to this colonial white supremacist structure. So what does it mean to be, I can give you the mission statement, <laughs> who we are, and that is who we are, but also we're constantly def redefining what craft is, but we, we're also a bridge between the community and academia. You know, so a lot of us did go to school here at UTRGV. And once we graduate, how do we apply what we learned directly into our respective communities? Everybody comes from a different part of the Valley or South Texas. So how do you inspire or apply what you learned on the street you grew up on or the neighborhood you hang out on? How do you apply what you learned uh, to your friends? And also knowing that craft is half academic knowledge and half street knowledge. You know, it's not all knowledge gets produced in academia. You know, it's like most of the knowledge is produced from the culture, from the people. That's real life knowledge, um, ancestral knowledge, community knowledge. So we try to create spaces, safe spaces that nurture that growth um, that we can publicly educate our community. We can celebrate each other. We can critique systems. We can think out loud, dream out loud, and we can question together. And collectively as a community, uh, we can figure out ways to come up with solutions to uh, problems that affect us here in South Texas, specifically on the border. Um, but yeah, it seems like the world is changing so much every week. So for us, we like to just keep our ears to the ground and let the community know that there is an organization here that uh, will stand up for them, will, will speak for the voiceless and give space and allow the, the voiceless to speak for themselves. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's definitely something that is continuing to be defined and redefined. Um, and that's part of what makes our organization special and unique um, is that we're not in this binary of we're this and that um, or this or that. Uh, we're this and that and everything that comes in between. So uh, that's a little bit of our org though, but we're definitely a Chicanx based social justice organization here in the Valley. And uh, uh, we attempt to host events that are culturally relevant and free for the community to engage in. And when did you create Craft Cultura and why? Also, did you have any specific inspirations for its conception? Um, so technically I created Craft Cultura in the summer of 2019, um, a few months after I graduated college. That's technically when I created it, but I like to say that craft was created in 1992, the year I was born, because it's a culmination of all my lived experiences. Mm -hmm. um, it's a culmination of growing up Mexican American in Corpus Christi. Uh, not feeling like there's any, so it's a culmination of like my upbringing, my academic journey, uh, straight up the community that influences me and raised me and then also social justice movements and collectives. But yeah, just growing up, um, not feeling like, knowing that your community exists, your immigrant community, your experience exists, but you, there's nothing that reflects you in textbooks and popular culture, movies, music, nothing that, that uh, reflects your community in an honest way at least. Um, the only time you're celebrated is Cinco de Mayo. And it's like, we don't even celebrate that. Um, so I knew we existed, but there was nothing that reflected that. Um, when you're taught about the civil rights movement and all that, um, you know, it, it's very black and white. You know, it's a black and the black and white relationship, African-Americans and, and white folk. And I was always like the kid, like, 
what about us? Uh, what about Mexican Americans? Where were we? So having teachers dismiss those questions or just kind of say, oh, y'all didn't exist or y'all didn't live in the U.S. yet or y'all were good. You just feel invisible and, and, and growing up um, and you try to assimilate also. You try to assimilate and, and slowly as you get older, going through the public schools, you start to purposely um, neglect where you come from, your roots. Why was I ashamed of my name being Misael? Why was I ashamed of my skin tone? Why was I ashamed of my mom cleaning houses, my dad being a custodian? Why was I ashamed that during vacation we went to Mexico and my friends went to Colorado? Why was I ashamed of a lot of shaming growing up? So, not that I had a bad childhood, but as far as culture wise, there was never any space that allowed me to celebrate my culture year round, ask these questions, participate in, 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 you know, anything that had to do with our culture. So once I moved to the Valley at 18, my world changed because now I'm around a bunch of raza. Now I can speak Spanish um, and not be ashamed. Now people can say me, Syed, you know, and it's not weird. It's not their first time ever hearing that. Um, my professors are Latino. My everybody here is like uh, Mexican American, Chicano. So that was the first time I was like, "Oh man, the valley is its own little world over here." And uh, where do I fit in? So now I moved to the valley, and I'm not Mexican enough over here. So I'm like, "Man, in Corpus, I was the most Mexican. Now I'm not." You know. So when I was able to major in Mexican American studies, that's that was the first time that I got the answers to a lot of the questions I had growing up. Uh, my experiences were being uh, validated. Uh, the Mexican-American experience was being taught the history, the culture, the arts, the sciences. Um, and it was really when I majored in Mexican-American studies that I saw myself reflected. And I wanted to be a part of that. A legacy of Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex, uh, you know, innovators. Um, and I just felt so cheated that we weren't taught any of this growing up, that, that I didn't take my first Chicano class until I was like 21. That's when I changed my major. And, um, but it was professors like Dr. Stephanie Alvarez, um, Dr. Francisco Guajardo, uh, Dr. Emmy Perez, Dr. Ernesto Ramirez. Those, these like Chicano professors that really took me under their wing and showed me a different form of education, a different pedagogy. They took me on trips to Seattle, to Jacksonville, to Mississippi, to Los Angeles, to Houston, to conferences, to social justice conferences. Um, they just had a, a different approach to education that was rooted in our ancestral knowledge. Um, and that really changed the way I saw education. And I was one of the students that was fortunate enough um, to take these trips and take these classes um, that my friends weren't taking. Um, they didn't even know it existed. So in these classes, I was learning a lot about social justice movements I was learning a lot about our, our civil rights leaders, our heroes, our sheroes. I was learning about our artists, our writers, um, the folks that resisted, uh, the folks that powered, and um, I just never knew this history existed. Um, so you, you, you match my upbringing with my you know, academic journey and then traveling to these other places and meeting other folks. What do you do with that knowledge now? Like, did I just take a trip? Now, what do you do with that knowledge when you come back to your community? So I just felt like when I graduated, I had to somehow figure out a way, and especially the trips with Dr. Guajardo and Dr. Stephanie Alvarez, I was just always at these trips. They focused a lot on on-site learning in the community. It was outside of the classroom, it was in the community. Um, 
you know, we would take trips to murals. We would paint murals. We would uh, meet with folks that were in the movement. Um, and then studying movements, it's self-studying the Chicano movement. Uh, that really inspired me also like, wow, like these were young folks, revolutionary kids in the 60s, late 60s that were organizing conferences for other students to meet in Colorado. You, you have a three day weekend with with Chicano students from all across the country meeting to figure out ways to, um, you know, j just in general, my major, Mexican American studies, that was that didn't always exist. Um, students fought for that in the 60s for ethnic studies, black studies, Asian studies, native studies, uh, Chicano studies. So the fact that what I was majoring in was due to students in the 60s that fought for that. And my university that's predominantly Chicano, Mexican American, Latinx, Hispanic, had no idea that major even existed. I said, there's a problem here. You know, there's a problem here. And, and, and is, it, is it the university's fault? Is it professor's fault? Is whose fault is it? Um, but I just knew that I was experiencing this and I had to figure out a way to apply these experiences and what I learned into the community uh, once I graduated. And I always wanted to be a part of an organization. I always wanted to be a part of a, like a movement. Like if I, if I grew up in the 60s, what would I have done? You know, who would I have joined? And there was other orgs in the Valley, but you know, Toni Morrison has a really cool quote. And she says, if there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it. So I kind of lived by that. And there was an org that I wanted to join, but it didn't exist yet. So I created it. And Craft Cultura was my, is my attempt to just take that culmination of my upbringing and create an organization that I wish I had growing up. Um, I wish there was young people that are doing what we're doing now um, and that allowed me to have space to have joy, that joy that you talk about. Joy is so important. Um, and joy is what we try to bring to the table as we uh, build. So, so many inspirations, um, but it's, it's, it's community that inspires me. And it's so hard not to be inspired every day when I drive in, in the valley and everybody's hustling, everybody's working, everybody's showing up. Like, how can you not be inspired by the lady selling tacos? How can you not be inspired by the mechanic? How can you not be inspired by the barbers? How can you not be inspired by the teacher? How can you not be inspired by the kids walking across the street, going to school? Like, inspiration is everywhere. And I just, little do they know that they inspire me. Um, and I'm just trying to create a space for us. Um, with craft, we try to just send smoke signals so that like-minded individuals that do want to build community and have these questions can um, come to our events and we help facilitate in different topics and discussions in a joyful way also. So, but uh, yeah, just to answer your question, uh, sorry, I'm being long-winded, but because it, it's a lot that inspires me and it's hard to just pinpoint one thing. It's, it's the authors in our community, it's the painters, it's, it's, it's just a culmination of so many people. It's you, you know, it's you interviewing me right now. Like everybody in our community um, is just such an inspiration to me. Um, so that's what we created Craft for, for us, for us to have a space um, because growing up in South Texas, we didn't have any spaces or any orgs that we could join um, that I felt represented the Valley or, or South Texas in an honest way. Um, you have LULAC, you have these other orgs and that's cool. I mean, they have their own roles, they have their own lanes, but I think it was time to bring a new org to contemporary South Texas where we're not this monolithic group. Um, we 
have kids that like punk rock. We have kids that like hip hop. We have, we have kids that like skateboarding. We have kids that like science. We have kids that like everything. So I think our narrative as South Texans has just been so one dimensional. Craft Kuku that just tries to give space for us to control our narratives. Okay. Um, um, how has Craft Cultura implemented uniqueness in its outreach methods or public events in the past? How have we, okay, uniqueness. Um, I'd say we're unique in in our outreach and public events in a few ways. Um, we're unique in how we view and approach the community. Um, so just just in how we our definition for community, it's not us and them and the community. Like we are the community, so we're from here. So it's not like, and I think a lot of folks get that a little bit um, tangled but for us we're unique because we feel like the community is our our family our extended family or family we haven't met yet now we're the ones that host the family reunions you know so we're unique in the way that we educate the community um, so if you've ever been to one of our events um, you know that it's in this non-traditional form. It's not in a classroom setting. Um, they're literally public events. And that's one of our philosophies from um, Brother Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party in Chicago in the late 60s. He said people learn through observation and participation. Uh, he said some things you could, either, some things you learn by either seeing it or participating in. And that's kind of something that we apply is that the community learns when they see a group of 10 people outside um, having a discussion. They, they learn uh, and they'll join and they'll participate. But I think what makes us unique, let's, let me give you an example. Our very first event, um, we got Dr. Marco Cervantes, the director of the UTSA Mexican American Studies program. We got him to come speak to, in the Valley and the MOS program at UTRGV uh, funded it. You know, they, they funded the expense and they said, well, you can, he can do a presentation on campus and our event was gonna take place on Sunday. So rather than host the event on a Sunday at the university, I thought nobody's gonna drive to the university on their day off on Sunday and walk up to the education building. So I said, well, you know what? Let's, let's host the event at a local coffee shop instead. So we're gonna have the director of a program, UTSA, who I met a few years prior in my undergrad at the National Association for Chicano Chicano Studies. And he did a lot of, uh, he goes by Mech Step also. He's part of a hip hop uh, duo called um, Third Root. And it's black and brown artists and they, they have conscious lyrics in there about you know sovereignty, indigenous land, about our culture. So I think what makes us unique is the guests and who we collaborate with. So I think that very first event set the tone for what kind of org we are and the style in which we approach education. So first location, rather than have it at the university that isn't accessible to everybody, it could be intimidating to folks that aren't there, let's host it at a Mexican owned coffee shop at Grind Coffee Co in Edinburgh, Texas. All right, let's 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 ask, you know, Marianne, the owner, Chicana owner, she allowed us to, she allowed us her space. All right, so now it's a public event. Rather than him coming in a suit and tie and doing a PowerPoint, no, Marcos, we're gonna we're gonna do a Q and A on a couch. And we're gonna have chairs, you know, um, Oprah Winfrey style. We're gonna we're gonna have a little Christina audience, um, you know. And I think what makes us unique is even the process of organizing an event is different. It's not this A squared plus B squared equals C squared um, structure. 
It's literally what we make it. I can facilitate and host the event, but it's what the people make it. That's what makes the event. Who shows up, who volunteers, who, who asks a question. The question that she asked takes the event another direction that I couldn't have planned. Um, but what makes us unique, like I said, is, is the guests. So many people had never seen a brown professor before, a Chicano professor with a shirt that says decolonize education, you know, with a big beard. People had never met a professor that does hip hop, you know, so we're bringing him from UTSA over here. And now they're learning about his story of how he comes from Houston and how the hip hop culture influenced his style of pedagogy now. Um, and, and him t connecting the dots. So we have a director now teaching folks from the community uh, for free and not, not teaching, just kind of learning out loud together, sharing his story. Uh, but also, we also always give space for the audience or the viewers uh, to ask questions and engage with our guests. So I think that's what makes us unique as well, is that in no way, shape or form are we the experts. We might be knowledgeable in a certain uh, field, but in no way, shape or form are we the experts and you're the student. It's like we're level head, we're, we're eye to eye here. So there's not a lot of events that you can go to that you have the opportunity to really meet this person um, and see them in a relaxed setting. Um, so I think that very first event uh, set the bar for what we do and how we do it. Um, you know, and you had one of the baristas from Grind make some conchas for the event, some vegan conchas. You know, Marianne from the coffee shop, she made some signature coffees for the event. So it's like I said, it's a communal way of, of organizing and there's no blueprint to that. So I think that's why we're unique because um, our events are kind of uh, what we make them. And after that first event, we ended up having a cumbia party <laughs> at, at my workplace at the time, Grain of Glass. And the guy that presented on hip hop, global activism and El Movimiento, so he had a presentation, he performed at night. So you could see him present and then you could see him perform later that night. Um, a few months later, we hosted an event at the IMAS Museum, Mental Health in the Latinx Community. And I facilitated the conversation with five different panel speakers. One of them being my former professor, Dr. Ernesto Ramirez, who teaches Mexican-American psychology. Um, Crystal Carranza, uh, uh, UTRGV alum um, in counseling. And she's a counselor, so she spoke about generational trauma. Um, we had Justina Garcia, who talked about grief and the, the stages of grief. Um, we had Caroline Benavides, who spoke about mental health in the LGBTQIA community. We had um, Sean Elliott Russell, who wrote a children's book on mental health called Be Still Little Tree, Be Still. So everybody, many people in the audience maybe have never seen an entire panel of Chicanx Latinx counselors. Like I think just visually what we do, what makes us unique is that us right now on this Zoom, it's like, it's two Chicanx Latinx folks. That's rare to a lot of people that aren't from the border. Um, they have their idea of what we look like, what we sound like. So I think what we try to do also, like just visually who, who we have, that's foreign to a lot of people. It's, it's normal to us, but to have a panel of brown folks intellectualizing mental health at the IMAS Museum, that was our first event at a public institution. Um, and that really showed, it proved at least to, to myself that, that we have the ability to really organize events and to have over 60 people show up on a Sunday to this free event at the IMAS Museum, the International Museum of Arts and Sciences, um, to have a conversation on mental health and how it affects us here in the, in the Latino community. Um, so again, so we have a, a, a event with the director doing hip hop and the movement. We have a mental health event and then we have a Noche de Arte where we display local South Texas borderlands artists. Um, 
We have, uh, you know, we have a book club called BYOB, Bring Your Own Book, where we read literature by writers of color. Um, we recently started having a, two, a 2K run where we promote health and wellness, and that falls, that still falls under our educational pillar and social justice pillar, believe it or not. Like, how does running align with education? But again, it's like education isn't just in the classroom. So we try to be creative with how we mobilize our community, how we um, bring folks that maybe would have never been exposed to this type of education or this. Um, and all, you know, some of us have backgrounds in Chicano studies, so we're trying to implement what we learned in the community. Um, and again, it's, it's really trial and error. Uh, but luckily, we've, we've uh, had a lot of, you know, what have felt like wins because the community has definitely shown their support. And uh, going back to joy, joy is at the center of that. You have to give people joy when building a movement, um, you know, when trying to dismantle these systems that continue to oppress us, when living in the valley, which is over-policed, over-militarized, um, how do you resist? We're in the belly of the beast here. Like we're, we're, we're in El Valle, we're on the border. Like this, this is where so much uh, of the fear so much of what America fears comes out of the narrative that folks um, sh share of what they think the valley is. Um, so we try to really humanize our experiences. And also, like I said, find joy in that in, in building community and redefining what that means, defining it together. Um, you know, that that's uh, what makes us unique. But our events are all over the place. And that's why I say it's hard to define us because we have a diverse collective and everybody brings different skills to the table. So, you know, Samantha can be hosting our, our, our runs and we run through neighborhoods and we're trying to make uh, physical fitness accessible to the community. And it's less about timing and pacing yourself. It's more about connecting with your body and we're living in a pandemic still. So people more than ever want to connect with each other. And I feel like Craft Cultura has been one of those orgs that um, uh, you, we host events, but you're also going to take something from it. You're going to meet somebody, you're going to learn something, and you're going to connect with this native land, connect with yourself, uh, know that you have purpose, and uh, keep building. But yeah, those are some of the things that make us unique is our, our, our events. Okay, so those are very creative outreach methods, but how do Craft Cultura's operations and plans change in response to the pandemic? So what does mobilization and outreach look like now? So our plans never change. Our plans have always been to educate the community, empower the community, inspire the community. The way, the way we did it, how we mobilized changed, uh, the whole world changed. So the way folks went to school changed, the way folks went to class, work, um, this interview, you know, we, we might have had it in person um, had it not been. So we definitely had to adjust um, to going to using social media as a tool, uh, continue using social media as a tool to uh, mobilize and and yes, yeah, social media, especially like Instagram, Facebook, it allowed folks to tune into our events virtually. Um, so we started a, a, a web series called Borderlands and Beyond, where we interview different guests on a range of topics, kind of how we would have done in person, but now you can tune in from the comfort of your home or, or wherever you are. You can ask the, the guests uh, questions, leave comments, um, and it really allowed us to broaden our reach. Uh, and I think the pandemic almost helped us grow even more 
uh, not necessarily the pandemic, but the fact that people, you know, could tune in more. They had more time to tune in to events. So our book club was virtual now. So you can be in Chicago. You know, some, some folks tune in from Chicago. Um, we have a member that tunes in from Indiana. Um, our book club curator, Victoria, she's in the Dominican Republic. You know, so it allowed us to really mobilize, like I said, outside of the valley and uh, have folks that are interested in the valley. And, and you know, one, one of our friends, Will, he lives in Chicago and, and he joined our book club and he he just had this idea of Texas, of, of the border. And uh, so joining, he was very impressed. And it's, it's crazy because he built friendships with members of our book club that he's never physically met. So it's been really interesting to see through a pandemic hosting virtual events, how we've built friendships virtually and uh, how people have joined our events and stayed connected. You know, that's where you share your Instagram with somebody else. You start to exchange books. People have sent each other books. People have sent each other just support. Um, so it's been really cool to see how um, through a pandemic, how you can mobilize, you know, you can reach across the world, you know, uh, somebody from across the world can, can join our event that had an idea of what the Valley was like. And uh, yeah, so I, th I think mobilizing, not only during a pandemic, but using social media as a tool to mobilize is something that has been um, helpful to raise awareness on issues as well. Um, you know, like recently we had the Stop Asian Hate movement um, and that reached us here in the Valley. We have the events with Adam Toledo, the passing of Adam Toledo, killed by Chicago PD through social media that reached us here in the Valley. Um, and the movements going on on the ground with uh, Dante Wright in Minneapolis. Uh, we're able to connect networks with them. But, you know, at the end of the day, social media is a tool to mobilize. And the real power is in the people in in-person events, in person. There's a time for both to organize online virtually, but we have to continue building um, in person. So thankfully these vaccines are rolling out and we're able to once again, mobilize and host events safely, as safe as possible in person. Um, but yeah, just the pandemic really allowed us to uh, adjust and how we mobilize virtually. So would you say that perhaps um, the pandemic has improved your outreach in a way? Yes, definitely. And so during this pandemic, um, what types of funding or fundraising, fundraising has Craft Cultura relied on? Um, everything has been just out of, out of pocket. Um, all of our events are usually in public spaces already. Um, so, you know, so, so you don't have to really fundraise to host an event at a park, you, but some of our members, they, they, you know, they, you know, like our, our community runs that we started hosting. That's like myself and maybe another member or two that just kind of out of our own pocket pays for the fruit that we provide fruit and water at the finish line. Um, started selling merchandise, uh, Craft Cultura merch, that way people that feel like they're part of the community. And I think that's what makes us unique as well, that you don't have to physically be in the Valley to be a part of Craft Cultura. You don't have to even meet me. Craft Cultura can mean something different to somebody else. Um, but so, so I think with the merch, it's allowed us to sustain ourselves and hosting more events. Um, we host online events on StreamYard, a Zoom, our book club, and all that costs something. So we haven't really, besides merch, 
um, that also comes out of my own pocket. Uh, we haven't really fundraised, to be honest, and I think it's something that we're at that point that we can start fundraising, asking for donations, because we rely on free events. And uh, but, you know, we 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 do it for the love of, of the people of the community. Um, but, you know, labor is still labor and some of our guests, you know, they're sharing so some of our guests are professors and, and have their PhDs and they're giving free lectures to the community. So uh, we're starting to be like, okay, like we accept donations, you know, to just help continue these conversations going because it's all for our community. Um, I, I like to think of craft as like for many that intro to Chicano studies class, you know, it's an intro level, but then there's also those events that we have that are grad level. Um, so you don't have to pay 700 bucks, 500 bucks, 100 bucks for uh, uh, an event with us. Um, but hey, if you can support financially, that's great. Uh, if you uh, By buying a t-shirt, a hoodie, uh, it goes a long way, it really does, because we try to stretch that dollar as much as possible and, and to continue to host events. Um, but yeah, so fundraising is something that we're looking into doing because um, you know, why not? You, you have to, a lot of other orgs, uh, unfortunately get a lot of fundraising done and, and, and you don't see their money go anywhere in the community. So for us that everything with like no budget, we've made such impact in the community. It's been, um, it's been great to see that, uh, we host so many free events and don't ask for anything in return. Um, but with some capital, our events could become, you know, even bigger. So we're at the point where we're starting to apply for grants. Um, that way we can get funded and compensated in this organizing work because it's a misconception that organizers don't need to be compensated. Um, and, uh, yeah, this is long life work, lifelong work. So, um, with that being said, it's like, we need to figure out a way to compensate those in our community that uh, volunteer their time. Uh, so that's something that we have in the works right now is fundraising, maybe a little chicken plate sale, something like that. Uh, because I'd like for our team to be able to fundraise and, and also travel to other places to meet other organizations, other collectives. I'd like for us to take a trip to Oakland and learn from visit the Huey P. Newton Foundation and learn from the Black Panthers uh, that lived during that time or, or the folks in Oakland that are building over there. I'd like for us to, you know, maybe take a trip to Houston and meet, you know, the Black Lives Matter Houston chapter that we donated to build with them. I'd like to continue to build these networks from virtual to in person once things uh, open back up. So fundraising is something that we definitely have in mind. And um... So have the roles of other Craft Cultura team members changed due to the pandemic? Um, not really. I mean, everybody just has different roles. Like Crystal is our counselor. She has her master's in, in counseling. So she'll host events um, on mental health. She was part of that mental health event at the museum. And she hosted an event with Justina Garcia on our web series, Borderlands and Beyond, on mental health um, during COVID-19. So they kind of spoke about, you know, uh, how this pandemic has affected our mental health. And that was a free episode uh, on our show. Uh, you know, my older brother, Christian, he, he just got his PhD in, in Chicano studies and, and sociology from Michigan State. And he's our craft cultura advisor. So anything that has to do with planning, organizing, we kind of go, go to him for that, that uh, you know, that, that to see what his thoughts are on, on how we can improve it and elevate our events. Um, Samantha, she's kind of in charge of health and wellness. And I'd say more than anything, her role has changed because she, she's just very enthusiastic and can do a lot of other things. But the roles haven't really changed. I mean, 
we have folks that are graphic designers and that's their role. And, and the, and our members have full-time jobs also. So that's their priority. So it's more like when it's time for your role to, you know, come to fruition, then we'll call you. But it's not like something that, again, we're very new organizations though. So it's very organic volunteer base. There's nobody on payroll. Um, so it's just kind of like, Hey, we'd like to have a mental health event this month. Are you willing to do it on the 15th? Yeah, I can do it. Let's plan. Okay. Hey, so our members have different skills, like I said. So once it's like time for that discussion, that topic, then I'll kind of go to them and we'll start to delegate plan together and envision the event and, uh, figure out how we can uh, make it happen. So roles haven't changed, but our members are just constantly, and they're also living in a pandemic, uh, trying to figure it out. So uh, it's just checking in on your members and making sure they're good. And 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 uh, you know, I feel like we're all friends actually. So we're all friends. We're all whether we're new friends or old friends. Like we're all, we've all become friends. So. We just check in on each other personally and the building will come through that. We'll continue building um, through those just hangouts. Let's go get tacos. Let's go, let's go, let's go eat. Let's go grow. Let's, let's go take a jog. Let's go paint. Let's go run, you know? So most of the organizing and planning is very organic. And then there is a time to actually like, Hey, from six to seven 30, we're going to focus on the actual event, but I think the inspiration for events just kind of hits uh, organically and you have to be able to be friends with who you build with. Um, you know, I think, I think it was Bell Hooks who said that she's like, I have to be able to go shoe shopping with whoever I'm building with. And I'm like, Oh, I like, I like that saying. Um, Cause uh, you know, if you're committed to this work, um, then, you know, you definitely have to, uh, take care of yourself in that process and check in on your friends, on your family. So the roles have definitely kind of uh, stayed the same, but we're always looking for new folks to join and find their role. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what we say is what's your role? Like, what's your strength? What's your craft? Um, and how, how can that, how can you join us in helping build the vision that we're building? Okay, and so what has been the most fulfilling aspect of operating Craft Cultura in the midst of a pandemic? And do you have any favorite moments so far? Most fulfilling is just feeling like I'm a part of the community here. Like I'm not from the Valley and it just feels good that this is my home now. Um, and that I'm doing my part to improve the community that I love so much, South Texas, this is where my heart is. And uh, it just feels very fulfilling to have found my purpose, my vocation. Um, this is why I was put here, you know, and I'm still figuring why, figuring out why, but while I'm here on this borrowed time that we have, um, it feels good to, you know, have created something that is impacting others and it's hard to there's no metrics to that to there's no metrics to if you inspired folks or empowered folks or so the most fulfilling thing is when people actually like tune into an event or show up because um as somebody that creates you just hope that other people will enjoy it um you don't do it for that but you just hope that um, the idea that you applied, the event that you organized, you, you do hope that people um, come out and support and get something from it. So the most fulfilling thing is planning an event, blank sheet of paper, fresh thought, fresh idea that kind of hit me out of nowhere, starting to envision it, plan it, and then the and then collaborating with a graphic designer to make a flyer for it. A designer that I didn't know maybe a couple months ago and that through the pandemic, we became friends. 
and this designer is from the valley. So it's like, okay, like I'm bringing you an idea and then you're, you're, you're bringing that idea to life with your graphics. And then that graphic reaching a bunch of people through social media and then real people and then and then people sharing it and then people actually coming to our events so it's just really cool to see the progression of that planning that mobilizing that you said how it has changed and uh and then to actually meet these like instagram people facebook people in real life and make a connection with them and the fact that they took time out of their day to join an event um to purchase a t-shirt to just you know i feel like all of us have the ability to transform the world we want to live in and, and to build a better world and so the most fulfilling thing is just seeing people like have fun at our events and like laugh and and, and find that joy and then and then tell me man i had a blast at that event when's the next one and, and that's the most fulfilling thing is when people say, so what's next? When's the next one? And uh, that's good pressure to have because it means they had a good time. Um, so the most fulfilling thing, yeah, is to see like, wow, you drove all the way from Westlaco to this event in McAllen. You drove all the way from Brownsville for this community platica. You're here on vacation right now and you joined our event. Wow, you opened up your business for us to host this event. Um, so. Craft Cultura has allowed me to really feel grounded in the community and feel like, you know, we're making impact. That feels nice. Um, and yeah, so, so, so that's, and then just random messages. There's the days that you feel like you have that imposter syndrome. Like, why are we doing what we're doing? You know, we're, we're not a, we're not a nonprofit yet. We're not, I see the guests that come on this, uh, on this series and I'm like, why am I even being interviewed? You know, um, so it's that imposter syndrome that sometimes hits you, but to see people like yourself reach out and to say, I wanna interview you, that's very new to me. Um, that's, that's scary, that's, uh, it makes me anxious and nervous because I can show you better than I can tell you. Um, I'm not used to being in front of the camera and no way am I like, oratory speaker like that so but i let my actions speak uh, so i can show you better than i can tell you but this has also got me out of my comfort zone and being like hey i have to i'm making an impact if, if somebody is asking to interview us so yeah the most fulfilling thing is all those things uh, seeing people just have fun at our events bring their kids become friends with each other and thankfully, in, in, in a global pandemic, we produce joy. We brought out love. We, we, we're building community. And um, it's always nice to get those text messages or those DMs from random people and, and that they just lift your spirits. And they're like, hey, love what you're doing in the community. Just know that you're making an impact in my life. Like that's like, whoa, um, that really, that really, um, you know, nourishes my spirit uh, because I care so much about the, the border, our people, our community, uh, South Texas, and the fact that slowly but surely, you know, we're, we're uh, watering each other and growing this garden. Um, and yeah, just creating these beautiful spaces of, even if it's temporary, temporary liberation, temporary freedom, um, even if it's at one of our events, it's like, hey, we can live in this world. And if you ever come to one of our events or check us out on social media, you'll see that, you know, we are revolutionary doers and thinkers and everything we do is rooted in love. And, and um, you know, it, it feels fulfilling that, you know, we're following the legacy of Dr. King and Malcolm X and Angela Davis and Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta and the Panthers and our parents and our ancestors. And, you know, we never went extinct. Like we're indigenous people living in the valley in 2021. And we're still here and we got something to say. So it feels good to build something that didn't exist. Uh, and the fact that people are believing in it and the, we're building a movement. Uh, 
to, you know, to, to, to create a better world um, for the next generation. And uh, yeah, I just feel proud of my community. I'm proud of myself. And uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, doubt and nerves that go into building anything new because there's no blueprint to this. I wish somebody had created craft for me so that I could just join. Um, so there's always uh, those times of self-doubt and you get tired in this social justice work. You get tired every week that you hear that there's a new shooting of, of our community. We're, we're literally dying out here. You know, they're, they're killing this, this white supremacist country that continues to apply pressure on us and, and choke us and try to suffocate us. And America makes us feel unwanted. And, and uh, so it feels good. It's fulfilling to know that we created an organization that lets the community know that, you know, we won't bend or fold, that we're here to protect our community, our elders, our kids, our women, and, and everybody. And we're here to dismantle these systems um, that are built to, you know, keep us marginalized and voiceless and that our grandparents, our parents did what they had to do so that we could get educated. And now it's our turn to make sure the next generation and the next generation um, never lives in fear. Uh, so it feels good to be part of that uh, generation of native indigenous Chicano uh, thinkers, um, resistors and yeah, we, we, we won't assimilate to this, this structure that is so destructive and continues to kill us um, through racism, through, through a pandemic, through that has disproportionately affected black and brown communities. So it's just fulfilling to know that, wow, like um, we're doing something right and we're still figuring it out as we go, but hopefully in 10 years, 20 years, Craft Cultura is still here and it'll transform into something else for the next generation to take control of it and figure out or be inspired by it and create their own thing. You know, hopefully by the time I'm 50, some kids um, can use this for their paper or something and, uh, or be inspired by it and know that in the Valley there, were, there was a group of uh, people that cared about them. And for the last question about craft cultura, what do you foresee in the future of craft cultura? And do you have any specific plans to advance the organization? Yeah, kind of like what I just said, like the plans though are, are I'd say short term are to become a nonprofit org. Um, that way we can get more funding or funding. We don't even have funding. So that way we can get funding grants, um, something tangible that people can see. Um, the goal is to have a center, the Craft Cultura Cultural Center, um, a place that we can host our events, bring in writers, authors, poets, um, educators, activists, organizers into our community in the Valley, people that we collaborate with and know. Um, so if it's a scholar in Philadelphia and Detroit and LA, we can bring them to the Valley and host them. Um, so we'd like to, one of my heroes is uh, Grace Lee Boggs, Asian American, uh, activists out of Detroit and she has the Grace Lee Boggs School, uh, Grace Lee Boggs Center and that's something that I, I envision us having here that Craft Cultura uh, has a center where we teach these courses by folks that are uh, qualified to teach them in Chicano studies, uh, culturally re relevant education, counselors, people that are part of our orgs that now have a space to educate the community. You don't have to go to the university. If you don't go to the university, you still have access to certain courses. Um, I just plan on, our plans are everywhere. I, I feel like we're gonna continue growing every month, every year um, with social media, without like, we're making an impact with people on the ground. Um, and yeah, so the plans are to have a center though. That's the plans. Um, that way our events can be, uh, we can grow as an organization and have uh, a space where we 
actually create a space to actually like go into. Uh, so yeah, there, there, there's plans right now in the works of figuring out how we can get a center in the community and it's ran by the community. And uh, this is a place that the community can come and, uh, you know, just grow together. Uh, so place that we have mental health classes, we have co uh, Chicano studies classes, we have a community garden, we have the arts, we have STEM, we just investing, investing in our community, but uh, it's not relying on academia anymore. Okay, and now to close, I'll ask you some final questions about yourself um, with COVID-19 again. So are you satisfied with the local response to COVID-19 in Edinburgh and Hidalgo County? Yes, I'm, I'm satisfied with, the, with how Edinburgh and Hidalgo County have handled it. Okay, and are you satisfied with the state response to COVID-19 led by Governor Gregory Abbott? No, not, not definitely not Greg Abbott. I think he's just been uh, irresponsible with how he's handled COVID-19 and opened places at 100% capacity before it was uh, time, before we were fully out. Um, yeah, the fact that baseball stadiums are full again. And yeah, so I'm not satisfied with, with that, that uh, he prioritized business over people. And were you satisfied with the national response of 2020 led by former President Donald Trump? Definitely not. Um, you know, over 400,000 deaths are on his hands, how he mishandled it. And, you know, he didn't create this problem, but he definitely um, mismanaged it and just didn't. He just caused so much death, so many losses that didn't have to, you know, be lost. So not satisfied with uh, Trump's, um, the lies that he spread as well, that that allowed his constituents to be irresponsible citizens and infect others, infect their own families. Um, but no, I'm, I'm definitely not satisfied with Trump's response. It was such a embarrassing and irresponsible way of, of, of handling it. And it was just an embarrassment to the country to see that that's our leadership, but it's also a re reflection of our country. That's, that's who the United States is. Um, so, but I wasn't satisfied with it. And are you satisfied with the current national response to COVID-19 led by President Biden and his administration? Um, so far, so far I am. So far, so good. I think he's been able to roll out, or his administration has been able to roll out vaccines that hit the valley really quick. Um, and it's just been good to see the transparency um, and him allowing the scientists to do what they do best. So that's been good to, to finally have a president again that will just let, you know, the ones that know the science be able to explain to us what's going on and be honest. Um, so I've, I've been satisfied so far. And if you had the power to respond to COVID-19 with policies, laws, or workplace decisions, what would you do differently, if anything? Just make sure that more community, marginalized communities, black and brown communities, um, have access to, you know, clinics or to uh, knowing that they're covered financially because they've been laid off. Um, you know, a lot of kids had to go back to, or had to go to school via Zoom. And uh, it was tough, it was tough if you don't have like Wi-Fi or you rely on school for your technology or for your meals. So. If I were to change anything, it's just kind of helping the most vulnerable um, really feel that, you know, that they were backed up in this, that they, they could uh, 
that they wouldn't have to worry about the rent. Uh, say educators just kind of know that. Um, so like, I wish more educators, because I have friends that are still in school or have kids in school, and it's like some some teachers are very strict on assignments and. And um, it's like, hey, we're, we're all going through this affecting us all, especially mentally. So I just kind of wish that uh, we, we handled it as a collective better. Um, I don't know what I would have done like policy wise, but um, I, I, I will say that. Yeah, I just wish that at least financially, that's a burden on so many families across the country not knowing how they're going to make it. So, so if uh, there was a way to, you know, compensate them. Okay. And last question, are there any other stories or experiences you would like to share with me that I have not asked about? Stories or experiences? Not really. I think, I think we covered it all, but yeah, just thank you for thank you for taking interest in interviewing me, uh, Craft Cultura, and uh, yeah, I guess the I guess story wise, I'd like to just ask you what what made you you know reach out to interview Craft Cultura, and how did you first like come upon us as a board? Um, well, I came across Craft Cultura via social media. Um, I was probably last year, I think, um, pre-pandemic, because I remember you guys were posting about the book club, but I think it was like the first or second meeting, but so it was pre-pandemic. Um, but I was, and I, I wasn't able to attend because I, I worked um, part-time at the time, so I always had a weird schedule, but ever since then, I was just always really interested in what you guys posted, like the historical stuff and the imagery you guys would post about like Aztec art and everything. Um, and I liked when in 2020, I got to see a more social justice element. So I, I, I've been interested in craft culture for a while. Um, and I just thought if you guys would bring an interesting perspective to the table, to the archives, right? Since like you mentioned, um, craft culture is a contemporary organization. So, I think craft culture represents something differently than like an org from the 60s or the 70s. All important, right? But mm -hmm. like a new perspective. Yeah, well, I'm, oh, thank you. Thank you so much like that, that you took interest and that means a lot. Um, and, you know, we're definitely proud of you for doing the work that you're doing. And, and so, yeah, I'm just excited for to see what we continue to build this decade as we, um, you know, step back out into this new world so interesting stories right now it's just like I, i'm just excited right now to see that um we're still in it but we're also still building and that each of us has the ability to you know do their small part in bettering the community especially all of us that are here from south texas um, i hope that you know if this does reach you please reach out to us uh, craft cultura and, you know, we'll, we'll figure out a way to, you know, host an event in your town, anywhere in South Texas, you know, whether you're in McAllen or Falfurias, Robstown, Kingsville, you know, our, our plan is to continue to grow throughout South Texas because there's so many places on the border in South Texas that just don't have access to culturally relevant education, to mobilizing, organizing, um, and yeah, we're just trying to redefine what activism looks like, like you said, in 2021 in, in the contemporary world. Uh, it's not just marching and protesting. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's how we live our daily lives. So thank you so much for having me as a guest. Of course. Thank you so much for your time, Isa. All right. Peace, y'all.